What is the proper role for Canada and for NATO in the conflict in Ukraine? What can we do and what should we be doing? I'm Candace Malcolm, and this is The Candace Malcolm Show. Everyone, thank you so much for tuning in. So the conflict continues in Ukraine. The bloodshed is horrific and the humanitarian situation is getting worse by the day. I wanted to bring in someone who knows and understands the region and NATO uh, better than anyone I know. Uh, my friend Garnet Janis. Garnet is the MP for Sherwood Park, Fort Saskatchewan. He currently serves as a conservative critic for international development. He also sits on the Foreign Affairs and International Development Committee, as well as being a member of the Canadian NATO Parliamentary Association. Actually, Garnet, I think the last time I spoke to you, had just gotten back from a trip uh, with NATO or, or in some capacity. I think it was to Latvia. Correct me if I'm wrong. I think that was in January. And you sort of talked a little bit about how this was uh, unfolding. And, and it seems like, you know, the situation's gotten so much worse in, in obviously in the last couple of days here, but 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 obviously since then. So uh, can, you, can you just set up what's going on, what, what's happening and uh, help us make sense of the situation in Ukraine? Yeah, Candice, well, thank you for the opportunity to, to speak to you. And, and uh, a lot has happened in Canadian politics and in, in international affairs since we since we last spoke. Uh, but it was uh, right after I had gotten back from a, a trip to Latvia and Sweden, uh, pairing with the with the Minister of Foreign Affairs. And it was in the context of the NATO summit that was taking place in, in Riga in the sort of late fall. Um, you know, at the time, I was certainly struck by the fact that uh, people were talking very seriously about the fact that that uh, it was important for the world to get ready for the possibility of various moves that uh, Putin could be making against Ukraine. And uh, really, right up until this this latest attack, and I think it's important to acknowledge that the invasion of Ukraine began in 2014, but this uh, this renewed invasion, this further invasion uh, that took place right right up until that happened, uh, there was uh, a number of possible scenarios that were considered in terms of the action he might take, uh, trying to uh, consolidate the Russian position in eastern Ukraine, um, seeking certain certain territorial expansion, uh, kind of jumping off from some of those existing existing points of occupation. Uh, but what we've seen uh, is really the worst possible scenario, uh, which is a, a full on assault at, at all points uh, coming in from uh, uh, from Belarus, which uh, unfortunately has uh, more and more uh, fallen under the the effective control of the Putin regime. Uh, so so attacks from uh, from eastern Ukraine, previously occupied areas, as well as uh, um, as amphibious attacks on the Ukrainian coasts and incursions from uh, from from Belarus, uh, so uh, are, are really bloody, violent, all-out assault on on Ukraine. Uh, it's been it's been tragic to see. Uh, it's also been inspiring to see the courage of the Ukrainian people. Um, the the uh, the kinds of uh, of things we often see and associate with politicians uh, being being that very negative perception, and yet the the remarkable courage that Ukrainian political figures have shown uh, the president of Ukraine saying, "I don't want to ride, I want uh, I want support," and uh, staying with his people. Uh, the 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 resilience, the the resistance, the courage of the Ukrainian people has just been been inspiring uh, to see in the midst of this. It's also been inspiring to see how. Uh, everyday people in Russia have come out, taken to the streets. Uh, I was at a rally in Edmonton uh, just uh, just on the weekend uh, with people of of Russian and Belarusian origin uh, who were coming with Ukrainian flags out to uh, specifically show that they stood with the Ukrainian people against the Putin regime as well. Uh, and uh, when when uh, people in Russia do this, when uh, members of the Canadian Russian community who may have family members back home, uh, that's it's inspiring to see as well. So it's a it's a dark time, uh, and uh, it's also a time in which we're seeing uh, these bright lights of uh, of courageous individuals and communities of people that are standing up against uh, the the aggression of the Putin regime. That's great. Yeah. So, uh, what do you uh, how do you see this playing out, Garnett? What do you, what do you what do you see happening next? What do you think the proper role of NATO is, and and how do you think we can get through and get out of this conflict? Well, uh, what. We have said as a conservative party, um, and and I fully support the approach we've taken here is to is to try to engage and work with the government to um, uh, to to have a uh, be particularly emphatic about the need to have a constructive tone here to put forward uh, proposals that we think should be should be undertaken. Uh, we support the action the government has been taking to date, and we also have been calling for further action. Uh, I um, I had been 
at the Foreign Affairs Committee specifically highlighting the benefits of sanctioning individuals tied to the Putin regime, investing Vladimir Putin's own money uh, abroad, and using uh, Navalny's list. Alexei Navalny, a key uh, Russian opposition leader, has put out a list of people who he thinks should be sanctioned. So using that list as the basis for, for sanctioning. Now, I was calling for that prior to the invasion. Uh, I thought that the the um, the previous invasion, which started in in, in 2014, uh, the other acts of, uh, of of violence that the the regime has been responsible for, uh, justified those sanctions being put in place prior to an invasion and as a deterrent step. Uh, there, there was a failure of deterrence here. I mean, there's there's no doubt about it. If uh, if if possibly if, if further steps had been taken that could have deterred the invasion in the first place, we wouldn't be in this situation as it is. But in any event, now, given where we are, uh, those those uh, those tough sanctions are really important. And um, and and I, I was pleased that just today the prime minister announced that they would be uh, applying sanctions to individuals based off Navalny's list. So it does it does show that opposition matters, that when we repeatedly say something in committee, uh, using Navalny's list a, as a guide, and then it shows up in the prime minister's own talking points later, it's, it's, it's encouraging to see that's, that's what we want in opposition. It's not to just be able to criticize the government, it's to actually see them take our suggestions from time to time. So um, we, what, 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 what we want to see NATO do, uh, Canada and, and our partners, is to have uh, sharp, debilitating sanctions targeting the Putin regime uh, that that force uh, the uh, the Putin regime to to reconsider the approach they've taken uh, significant support to the Ukrainian people in the form of uh, of, of uh, humanitarian and lethal uh, lethal weapon support and uh, debilitating sanctions targeting the Putin regime uh, that that combination uh, can um, can help uh, tip the balance hopefully and support the work that you, Ukrainians are doing so I, I mean, when I, when I hear sanctions, it seems to me like that's that's something that you take against a hostile regime sort of early on, um, not in the midst of a hot war, right? Like we we have uh, debilitating sanctions against Iran, and the Iranian regime gets sort of weaker and weaker over time. Um, but they also sort of strengthen their totalitarian grip on their own people. Um, I, 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 I wonder if there is like like another not non sanction related. Uh, efforts that, that can be made. I mean, I mean, you're you're part of the committee with NATO. What, what do you what do you think when you hear uh, people talk about expanding NATO into Ukraine or the whole idea of a no fly zone? Uh, do, do you think that would that that that's going to be necessary at some point? Uh, as, as, or or do you see this sort of uh, ending, you know, with a peace negotiation? Do you think that this conflict can end with peace with a negotiation, or do you think it'll just continue until it hits a hot war or one side surrenders? Um, well, I mean, it's, it's a bit of a cliche to say that all conflict ends with talks, um, you know, in, in some form, but, uh, you know, um, the, the, the circumstances of any negotiations, I think would, would have to be ones in which, uh, the, the Putin regime was, was so, uh, able to see the costs to itself associated with ongoing conflict, uh, that it, that it lost the will to perpetuate the uh, the ongoing uh, acts of violence. So, um, the the conversations that 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 might happen under those circumstances matter, of course. But the the circumstances that happen in the lead up to that are are critically important as well. Uh, I mean, let's let's state the obvious that Russia is a nuclear power. Uh, that there are significant risks that have to be taken into consideration in the form of um, of points of of uh, of escalation, like like would be involved in a uh, creating a no fly zone. I mean that does that does imply uh, pretty clearly that we would be um, we would be shooting down Russian planes, and that and that's uh, I mean that would be a, a very significant uh, escalation. Obviously, um, I, I mean I, I think look the, the the goal for the NATO alliance is to uh, be effective in deterrence first and foremost, and um, and I think I would argue that uh, NATO expansion has been successful in deterrence in the cases where NATO has expanded. Uh, there, there has not been aggression like this against the Baltic states, against Poland. Um, I think the the reality that aggression against those states would automatically mean uh, a hot war between Russia and NATO. Uh, that's a significant uh, significant deterrent. And the Putin regime went into Ukraine in a context in which uh, the the um, 
you know, the, the American administration in particular had already made clear that um, that there would be sanctions and there would be other forms of retaliation. But when it came to fighting, uh, Ukraine would be on its own. So um, so there was there was, I think, a, in retrospect, clearly there was a, a failure of deterrence there. Um, you know, <laughs> retrospect is what it is, though, as, as, as you say, I mean, we have to deal with with what we're dealing with right now. And and I, I, I would say it's it may not feel like enough, but strong coordinated sanctions uh, can have a, a really powerful impact in terms of starving the Putin regime of the capacity to rate to wage war. Um, so, and there's and there are so many more things we need to be doing. Conservatives have been talking, for instance, about the oil and gas sector and the fact that uh, that Europe's dependence on Russian gas has limited their ability to impose sanctions in, in response to past events. And so, we need to step up as a country in terms of being able to supply Europe with alternative sources of uh, of energy, so it's not as dependent on 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 Russia. Um, the, these kinds of measures do have a significant impact, and um, you know, I. I, I look at what's going on and I, I think, man, I wish we could do more. Um, and we should always look for ways to do more uh, in a way that's, uh, that's prudent and, that, um, and that, that leads the Putin regime ultimately to, um, to, to back away or to other actors within Russia to, to say enough is enough. Well, I'm glad to hear you you say uh, clearly and uh, unequivocally that that uh, you don't want this to turn into a uh, hot war between NATO and Russia because that would be uh, like you like you mentioned and alluded to really terrifying with a nuclear power. I was going to ask you about Canada's oil and gas sector and the part it plays, but you kind of pivoted there yourself. So I'll, I'll move on to a question I wanted to ask you about uh, our Prime Minister Justin Trudeau. So he was in London today. He had a meeting with, uh, sorry, London yesterday. I think he's still there today. He's in London, had a meeting with Boris Johnson at 10 Downing Street. And uh, what we saw were uh, people protesting him to the extent that he couldn't even get to the front door and he had to go um, into the back door. So I'm, I'm, I'm just wondering if uh, you think that Canada and Justin Trudeau's reputation uh, have taken a hit uh, over his handling of the trucker convoy, I know you were uh, critical of of his of his use of the emergency powers. Uh, how do you think Canada's reputation has changed? Well, I, I think um, uh, the use of the Emergencies Act was a big mistake. I spoke against it in the House of Commons. I think it raises significant questions about the health of our democracy, about the government's commitment to civil liberties, and uh, these are these are arguments that we're um, we're going to continue to make and. Uh, obviously, um, this also uh, informed my private members bill, which I know we're going to we're going to talk a little bit about later, trying to provide greater legislative protection for people on the basis of their political views in Canada. Uh, it is noteworthy that uh, countries around the world, uh, that, that, that peoples around the world, media outlets uh, paid some attention to what was happening. And, uh, you know, I, it's sort of interesting for me, I, I'm always listening to some some podcasts and, and uh, news items from around the world, obviously, to get perspectives from around the world. And there was a period of time when everybody was talking about Canada and uh, and and not not in a good light. Um, I think uh, people, centrists, progressives, people that weren't invested in the partisan dynamics here in Canada, uh, even from the center left, were very surprised uh, by the heavy handed, illiberal uh, approach that Justin Trudeau was uh, was taking, and um, and I think that, that that's in a context where people generally have a very positive view of Canada. They see Canada as a as a great country, uh, characterized by freedom and pluralism, uh, and um, and and so it was kind of this this moment of dissonance for a lot of people in terms of looking looking at what what, what happened. And let's acknowledge that there was some some hyperbolic commentary about what was happening in Canada from from external sources as well. Um, but uh, but look, it, I don't think it helped us in terms of projecting a positive image around the world. And I don't think it helps us uh, when we try to uh, speak to other countries about what, how they're responding to different protest movements that happen in, uh, in other places. Um, so so this, was, this was, I think, part of the dynamic. And, and I think it will have some, uh, hopefully it won't have, have lasting implications for Canada's brand, but I think it will certainly have lasting implications for the prime minister's brand. Yeah, I think one of my favorite videos that came out from the Tucker Convoy, and so much of it, you know, in today's era, you don't have to go through intermedi intermediaries like the CBC and the Globe and Mail. You can see for yourself what's going on uh, in the news. And 
uh, th there was this one clip that people were circulating on TikTok and it made it onto Instagram. And it was Justin Trudeau characterizing uh, the protests as, uh, you know, people waving intolerant flags, uh, people stealing from the homeless, people desecrating monuments, and uh, people being like racist and hateful, something like that. It was it was a Trudeau speech. And someone had taken uh, Trudeau's speech, like the sound, and laid it over images of the exact opposite, like the exact opposite of those, that uh, characterization was what was happening. It was like, people were feeding the homeless, there was free food for everyone the entire time. Uh, people were cleaning the monuments and keeping the streets clean. And, and you know, you had this like impeccable, uh, you know, whatever it was, captains, street captains that were making sure that the sidewalks were shoveled and that there was no garbage. Uh, you know, that you had people of all these different backgrounds. So, so everything Justin Trudeau said, it was the exact opposite that was uh, playing out in real life. And I think that that, that was pretty powerful. Okay, Garnett, I, I do want to talk to you about your private members bill because uh, it, it's, yeah, it's, it's really interesting. So you, you introduced a private members bill to amend the Canadian Human Rights Act to protect those who are discriminated against because of their political beliefs. So uh, why don't you explain to us what you uh, seek to accomplish with this? Yeah, so uh, the Canadian Human Rights Act uh, prohibits discrimination on the, on the basis of various criteria, uh, race, sexual orientation, um, uh, national origin, uh, marital status, religion, uh, age, gender. Uh, and my proposal is to add uh, political beliefs uh, and activity as prohibited grounds of discrimination in the Canadian Human Rights Act. Um, I guess a couple things to, to, to say uh, off the top on this. Number one, uh, there is an important distinction between discriminating with among ideas and discriminating against individuals based on the ideas that they hold. Uh, clearly, it's legitimate to think some political ideas are superior to other political ideas or to think, um, and, and, that, and that's already an issue with uh, with other criteria, for instance, uh, you can't discriminate on the basis of religion, but you're allowed to think, hey, my religion is uh, it, it represents the fullness of truth and someone else's uh, doesn't. Um, there's there's a difference between discriminating about ideas and discriminating against individuals. So in, in terms of prohibiting discrimination against individuals on the basis of their political beliefs or activities, it's about saying that uh, that that governments or banks uh, shouldn't be able to fire someone or deny someone service on the basis of their political beliefs, uh, that if, you're, if your employer finds out that you're a conservative, they can't fire you because of that, um, uh, that, that uh, government uh, cannot say, we're going to treat different groups of people differently on the basis of their political beliefs or their, their involvement in, in, in political activity. And, um, and I think this intuitively makes sense. It respects the freedom of individuals to be involved in, in political speech and activity without fear of reprisal. I think many Canadians would actually be surprised to find that it wasn't already uh, protected. Um, but we are seeing cases and, and uh, the government's response to the convoy is one example where I think a lot of people saw uh, political political discrimination uh, happening um, in terms of maybe the the tone and the approach being taken to one group of protesters that was different than uh, what had been applied in in the past in analogous cases where people were were uh, were protesting with respect to uh, to different uh, causes. But this is something that I was working on long before uh, this this particular incident, and and um, it's in part uh, inspired by um, uh, by some of the work just being done looking at. Uh, so-called woke capitalism, when big corporations are trying to push political agendas, uh, there's uh, there's a book called Woke Inc. that uh, that I would I would recommend by a, an American tech entrepreneur named Vivek Ramaswamy, and um, you know his his insight is that we are seeing this phenomenon of of companies that uh, have political objectives that are are using their corporate power to advance those political objectives and have uh, the protections that were invented as being for uh, for private sector companies to encourage innovation but they're actually now using the 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 power and the protection that comes with being a private sector corporation to advance political objectives and that's really out of step with what the purpose of a corporation should be and it undermines uh, democracy it allows uh, corporations to uh, by by influencing their employers by uh, by controlling uh, content with on, within their platforms to be able to advance a, a political agenda. So um, kind of looking at it from, from the perspective of government discrimination, as well as uh, the way that certain corporations may try to, to uh, exercise corporate power through discriminating on the basis of political views. Uh, this is something that I think needs to be addressed. Uh, and I'll just make one, one final comment about that. And, and it's, 
that, that although this is a, a new idea at the federal level that responds to new new emerging realities and, and challenges, it's not particularly radical. I mean, most provinces and territories have some degree of protection uh, in their in their human rights uh, legal frameworks for uh, some political belief, or they use similar terms. So uh, this is. Um, uh, this is not unprecedented. I mean, many Canadians live in jurisdictions where, in terms of, uh, of provincial jurisdiction, they already have these protections. Uh, but some provincial jurisdictions and federal jurisdiction, these protections uh, do not exist. So, uh, so I'm putting this out there as an amendment to the Canadian Human Rights Act. And uh, I've gotten a lot of positive commentary on it uh, so far. And um, uh, so it's this is this is where we're at and uh, and hoping to continue the conversation, get this bill passed at some point. I think so many Canadians were just sort of dismayed and beside themselves to see the doxing of people who had donated to the uh, trucker convoy give send go campaign. Uh, so many people ended up losing their jobs. Uh, well, at least at least a handful of high profile ones. People, some people were uh, intimidated. Uh, stores had their you know vandalized and protested. Uh, would would your private members bill? Uh, protect those people? Uh, would, would, it, would it like retroactively help them uh, get get their jobs back if, if it were to be passed? Uh, how, how, would, how would it work in that situation? Well, I don't think a bill like this would apply uh, retroactively. Um, uh, and uh, there is a distinction between someone facing discrimination and someone just having people uh, be mean to them, right? Um, they're, they're, uh, if, if somebody if somebody wants to boycott a business on the basis of the political activity of the owner, uh, there's no um, there's no uh, good good mechanism for for dealing with that legislatively. I mean, I would I would generally tell people, you know, if you if you're looking at what restaurant to go to, do so on the basis of of what food you like, not <laughs> who the owner votes for. Uh, I think I think uh, you know we we promote a better, more harmonious society if we don't seek to uh, to punish each other for having the wrong political views through through commercial means. But um, but it, it, I mean, it, a bill like this couldn't couldn't and wouldn't address those kinds of boycotts, but it would address the case of of somebody um, firing an employee or denying someone service on the basis of their their political views. Let's say uh, somebody had uh, made a, a small donation to uh, to the convoy and their employer found out about it. Um, this this bill would, I think, provide some protection uh from that person being fired and, and it, it would apply across the board. I mean, you could imagine a, a case theoretically where there's a, a conservative employer who finds out that his employee is, uh, is volunteering for, for the NDP on their time off and says, Nope, that's not, that's not how we vote at this grocery store. You're out. Um, and I think most people would say that that's, that's unreasonable just as someone shouldn't be fired uh, because of their religion, because of their sexual orientation, because of their marital status. Uh, someone shouldn't be, uh, be fired for engaging in political activism that reflects their their sincere convictions uh, there would be would be one area of exception and that would be where it's a bona fide occupational qualification where it's where it's actually necessarily related to the work being done so uh, if, a, if a member of parliament who's like a, I as a conservative member of parliament parliament my I hire staff that generally share my worldview and that's reasonable because it's a political workplace uh, there there may be situations like for for election workers where people uh, part of the criteria for hiring someone is political neutrality and and that is a case where it's legitimate to take into consideration someone's political activity um, but in the case of of most workplaces that are not political by nature uh, where the activity is uh, is not political advocacy but it's just uh, commerce making things selling things things, uh, people shouldn't face employment related consequences uh, for for engaging in political activity that reflects their sincerely held beliefs. Well, I absolutely agree with that. I think that's a great initiative, Garnett. Uh, good for you for proposing that and hopefully uh, it gets passed through. So uh, Garnett, I really appreciate your time. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Candice. Always a pleasure. Always a pleasure as well. All right. Thank you so much. I'm Candice Welcome and this is The Candice Welcome Show.